Hello, my name is Ahmad Awadallah. I am a research manager here at Microsoft Research. Today I'm happy to be introducing presentations in the efficient deep learning and large scale AI track at the Microsoft Research Summit. At Microsoft Research, we aim at building AI that benefits more people more often. The AI landscape has been transformed by the advent of large scale models. Every year, we reach new heights in performance, capabilities, and applications. And this growth in performance and capabilities has been driven in large part by growth in the size of the models. Despite these recent breakthroughs in deep learning, humans still learn much more efficiently than machines in terms of energy consumption and the amount of supervision needed to learn a new skill or to perform a new task. There are still tremendous opportunities to fully realize the promise of AI by making large-scale models more efficient and hence practically applicable across a broader range of applications, more adaptable to new tasks and unexpected conditions, and more seamlessly integrated with human intelligence. Today, we will focus on three research directions at Microsoft that are making progress against these challenges. First, is making large-scale AI models more efficient. To bring AI to more people, models need to be cheaper to train and run in terms of computational and human resources. Increasing efficiency across various parts of the training and inference pipeline includes optimizing existing large models and creating new models with new architectures and new training paradigms. Second, is making AI more adaptable to new tasks and unexpected operating conditions. Modern AI systems perform a relatively small number of tasks compared to humans. To bring the benefits of AI to a broader set of scenarios, we need to develop AI that can learn to quickly accomplish new tasks and to adapt to new and changing environments. Finally, making AI more seamlessly integrated with human intelligence and aligned with human goals. For the AI we develop to benefit people, we need to facilitate intuitive human AI collaboration and effective human oversight of AI systems. Today, you will learn about these research directions from several researchers at Microsoft, including researchers Shobu Makhraji, Aida Momenjad, David Alvarez Mellers, Scott Lumberg, and Mark Alexander Cote. We will also have Yi Ching Hu, partner research manager at Microsoft, to discuss her team's work with Deep Speed a deep learning optimization library that makes distributed training easy and efficient. A number of collaborators will also join my Microsoft colleagues to present talks today. Song Han from MIT will speak about his group's work on efficient and tiny ML. Colin Rafal from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, will discuss a call to action for building continually improving and collaboratively developed pre-trained models. And finally, Karthik Narasman from the Princeton University will speak about his work toward building embodied interactive agents that operate in the real world. Finally, we will have Susan Dume, technical fellow and lab director here at Microsoft Research, hosting a fireside chat with Chief Scientific Officer Eric Horvitz and University of Washington Professor E. Jin Choi. Together, they will look ahead at the next generation of AI systems and share their thoughts on the most important lines of research and how we can turn them into technologies that bring the benefits of AI to more people more often. To kick off the day, I'm delighted to present our first session, where Ashley Lawrence, Distinguished Scientist and Managing Director of Microsoft Research Outreach, will speak about emerging directions of research and applications in large-scale AI. Ashley will host a discussion with researchers and artists who are using AI in new creative ways, and a fireside chat with Kevin Scott, Microsoft's Chief Technology Officer. Thank you for joining us today as we explore research toward building AI that benefits more people more often. Without question, there is a lot to learn about the nature of intelligence, human or otherwise. Yet we share an intuition about how we use our intelligence to pursue an amazing breadth of goals spanning from work to play. At any given moment, 
We're taking in rich sensory information about the world and about ourselves and mapping those inputs to the next action we take. Our brains and bodies have learned to perform this mapping over the course of every experience we've had in our lives up until that moment. Machine learning enables machines to learn increasingly sophisticated mappings of their own, ideally from inputs we provide to outputs we intend. Instead of being programmed explicitly, these functions, or AI models, are learned from data and learning experiences prepared by researchers and developers. Large-scale AI is a new paradigm of self-supervised deep learning and increasingly large AI models. Large-scale AI models are already revolutionizing the products and tools we use every day. They are also spawning new research frontiers aimed at realizing the opportunities they present while mitigating risks. In this talk, I will briefly introduce some of the key drivers behind this wave of large-scale AI, share a few applications that illustrate recent trends, and sketch some of the research frontiers aimed at making large-scale AI more efficient, adaptable, and collaborative, and ultimately empowering more people more of the time. Machines capable of more sophisticated function mappings enable us to interact with AI in exciting new ways. So let's say I'd like some help from AI to make it through one of the cloudy days here in the Pacific Northwest. GPT-3 is a large-scale AI model from OpenAI that generates text completions based on prompts like the one I've used here. When I input my envisioned scenario, GPT-3 adds the sensation of cold sand under my feet, which honestly hadn't occurred to me at first. DALI-2 is another OpenAI model that maps from text descriptions to generated images. Here, DALI-2 is adding a visual experience to my envisioned scene. And finally, the NUA Infinity model is animating the scene for me. NUA Infinity is a research model developed at Microsoft that can take in an image as if it were the first frame of a video sequence and output the predicted video sequence. Here, I've used the image generated by DALI-2 as the input to NUA Infinity. AI models like the ones I've just demonstrated are already having a profound impact on the way we collaborate with machines. Even as AI models and systems become more complex, our interactions are still shaped by the basic paradigm of crafting inputs to produce the intended outputs. I caught up with Adam Trischler, a researcher at Microsoft, and Gabrielle Loisel, a science fiction writer, to learn more about their recent exploration of creative co-writing with AI. Very nice. So, so, so taking that over, over to you now, Gabrielle. So why did you say yes to this? Why was, uh, why was this interesting to you? Oh, I've been writing with Botnik since 2018, and we've worked pretty exclusively in humor and doing things like parody. And it's so, so delightful. But I was really interested in seeing how I could branch out into creative writing that wasn't humorous and wasn't parody. I have a degree in creative writing, like my undergrad degree is in creative writing. And I started playing around on GPT-2 and I realized there's so much potential here. It's such, it's the way that GPT-2 thinks is, thinks is utterly inhuman. And being able to have a writing partner who knows everything and understands nothing is so novel and delightful um, and then when I heard about an opportunity to use GPT-3 which I'd been wanting to do for ages ever since I heard about it I was like oh absolutely I have to say yes to this yeah that's fascinating no uh, a collaborator that knows everything and understands nothing that, that's super <laughs> yeah go ahead you can you can tell Gabrielle's a writer. Yeah. <laughs> that's the perfect turn of phrase. <laughs> yeah, I mean, GPT three especially like it's very different from GPT two, and because it's been trained on almost everything, it's so good at so many things. But at the same time, it's it's excellent at imitating, and it is pretty abysmal often at innovating. And that's where you have to have the human element because GPT-3 will always sort of take the path of least resistance to the most cliche thing you can think of and getting it to like jerk 
the reins over <laughs> to back onto the road and say, no, 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 let's do something interesting. Let's do something creative. That's where a human comes in, a, a writer. So in terms of this collaboration, can you give us some examples like like you actually you actually produced stories that you intend to try to go publish now? Is that right? Oh, yeah, I wrote okay. I wrote 11 stories. I think it was 11. Um, and one of those was a 60 plus page novella, which I was able to produce so much more writing than I ever have in my entire life in just two months. It was I was shocked and I was the one who was doing it. <laughs> you know, kind of go going back to this, uh, you know, sentiment that you expressed about maybe being more productive at writing or being able to produce more. Um, what are some of the ways in which this paradigm uh, for working made you more productive? A lot of the time, there's a lot of establishing you need to do in writing, like, your character walks into a hospital and you need to describe the hospital to some degree, GPT-3 can just psh, do that instantly. And it, it did end up saving so much labor on my part, but also it would do things that were so unexpected sometimes. Um, and I could even, if I wanted to, there, GPT-3 has different voices. So it has Da Vinci, which is the, the smartest one that has the most human-like language capabilities, all the way down to a, a really teeny tiny model called Ada. And if I wanted to get weird, unnatural language, I could lower the size of the model or make it a little less smart. And it would take me in these directions I never would have anticipated. So it was constantly giving me inspiration and helping me to think of things that I might have never considered working with another human or just on my own. When we started this project, one of the things that I was hoping would emerge or come out of it um, was that, you know, AI co-written literature would be something different, like something truly unique in a way, like, like not just not what you would see written by one person or a couple people or even a team of people. I want I I didn't know what that would look like because it didn't exist yet, but I kind of was hoping for this. And, you know, that's hard to do. And that's a super, it's a super ambitious claim to make to say that, you know, there's this new kind of literature now. But um, what I will say is that I feel like with Marlene and some other stories, Gabrielle has really taken us down that road. Like, I feel like, Gabrielle, you were really able to harness what, what we might call the bugs of writing with language models and AI. Like, the flat cliche, the, the robotic boringness sometimes, the run-on sentences, the repetition, the occasional nonsense or wacky non sequiturs, as you're saying. I feel like you really learned how to harness those bugs as features to make effective, weird, new narrative. But in terms of the research, there actually there are so many directions we could go based on you know what what Gabrielle has discovered and and some of those are like a human computer interaction direction how do we um, how do we improve um, GPT three as a writing collaborator but more on the side of like um, user experience and user interface um, you know augmenting just that you know that that pain where you fill in words and 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 get words back with, um, you know, maybe some some structured representations about plot, character, uh, relations among things in the story, um, a timeline of the story. And then I think what's most interesting for me is Gabrielle mentioned this, um, this limitation. So GPT-3 can only read, um, it can only keep, let's say, 4,000 tokens in its, in its working memory, um, if we want to call it that. And so how do we how do we either break that limitation uh, so that GPT three or you know whatever the next model is can hold more context and history um, in its in its working memory and build upon that or so so break that limitation or work around that limitation um, by learning how to maybe summarize what's come before or represent it in a different way 
um, like, yeah, we, we've talked about graphical structures or timelines, um, maybe uh, embeddings. But yeah, I, I mean, there, there are all sorts of directions we could go. But I think, yeah, one of the most interesting ones for me um, is, is that, that piece, that memory piece. Like, how do we give uh, GPT-3 a true um, extensive, extensible working memory? Now let's talk just a bit about how large-scale models are trained through a process of self-supervised learning. In self-supervised learning, Machines learn directly from the structure of data, language in this case, rather than from explicitly labeled input-output pairs. This distinction is key for creating the kinds of huge data sets needed to train large-scale models. Consider the text prompt that I used earlier. AI models take in numbers, of course, not words and letters. To turn a text sequence like this into inputs for an AI model, we must first break it up into pieces, called tokens. There are 12 tokens in the phrase I used earlier as processed by a particular tokenizer. GPT-3 was trained using nearly half a trillion tokens like these scraped from the internet. For scale, all of Wikipedia is comprised of a mere 4 billion tokens. The question is then, given all of the token sequences in data sets like this one, how can we optimally construct representations that capture meaning and context and enable a model to perform our desired tasks. The transformer architecture addresses questions of how to optimally encode and decode data. Encoding maps token sequences to representations that capture context. Decoding maps encoded prompts to newly generated sequences. Simply put, encoding facilitates understanding of patterns in existing data, and decoding facilitates generation of new patterns like the text, images, and videos in my earlier examples. The transformer is the current standard architecture for creating large-scale AI models through self-supervised learning. Since its introduction, we've seen many variations of this architecture from research to application. Variations of the architecture utilize different transformations of input data, each taking slightly different approaches to encoding and decoding. All are aimed at capturing aspects of context and meaning by analyzing the relative positions and co-occurrences of tokens. Since the introduction of self-supervised learning and other enabling innovations, we've seen a clear trend in large-scale transformer models. Bigger and better. So, what do I mean by bigger? Over the last several years, we've seen an exponential increase in the size of these models. The plot that I'm showing here appears linear but is on a log scale. Some of the earliest models contain tens of millions of parameters, while recent models have contained hundreds of billions of parameters. That's four orders of magnitude in about as many years. The next wave of models seem likely to continue this trend. There remain many open questions about the kinds of capabilities that will emerge as the number of parameters in models like these approach, for example, the number of synapses in the human brain. Of course, the capability of a model is linked not only to the number of parameters it contains, but to how that capacity is utilized in its architecture. Along those lines, I personally find it fascinating that we don't actually have a rigorous theory on how to scale these models. Even as we work to create larger models, research teams at Microsoft and across the community are working to develop a theoretical understanding of how to optimally construct these architectures and what the optimal relationship should be between the size of these massive models and the size of the data sets we use to train them. Recent works have emphasized the importance of scaling up the size and quality of the data sets we use for training the models, even as we scale the models themselves. While a recent theoretical result proves that over-parameterizing the models relative to the data is actually necessary for model robustness. Even as we seek new theoretical understanding, new large-scale AI models are providing new insights and new empirical evidence, even as they yield better performance on real-world tasks. And what do I mean by better? At Microsoft, this progression has produced a growing family of large-scale AI models. These models are developed by teams within Microsoft, spanning research and product, and by our partners at OpenAI. 
They provide understanding and generation capabilities across numerous products and services, spanning data modalities including language, vision, and code. Recently, Better has also included convergence along various dimensions. For example, we're seeing a convergence from monolingual models to multilingual models that can handle tasks in many different languages. Similarly, we're seeing convergence from unimodal to multimodal models that can handle different data modalities, like language and vision within the same model. For example, the latest natural language representation model from Turing jointly encodes 94 different languages within a single model. As part of the current search experience in Bing, this model summarizes information from multiple representative sources in response to a user query. Inputs in English produce outputs in English. Inputs in Italian produce outputs in Italian and so on. So better here means multilingual. Recently, better has also meant multimodal. The Florence model, available through Azure Cognitive Services APIs, jointly encodes both text and image modalities. This enables capabilities like text-based image retrieval and the recognition and discovery of novel objects using an open vocabulary instead of a closed set of object labels. In the example shown, we ask AI to recommend a game for kids of age 10 or greater using only a photo of games on the shelf. Florence discovers and recommends Batman. The true game restriction is shown here, but was actually invisible in the input image. Perhaps the most impressive thing about large-scale models is their ability to be adapted for a wide variety of applications, either directly or through a process of fine-tuning. One such application is called GitHub Copilot. It uses Codex, which was created by fine-tuning a GPT model using open source code from GitHub. I caught up with Microsoft Chief Technology Officer Kevin Scott to talk about the use of applications like Copilot to support cognitive labor and where human-machine collaboration could go from here. I'm Ashley Lorenz with Microsoft Research. I'm excited to be joined by Kevin Scott, Chief Technology Officer at Microsoft, for a discussion on large-scale AI. Thanks for being with me today, Kevin. Yeah, thanks for having me, Ashley. All right, sure thing. So I really loved um, an article that you wrote uh, recently on large-scale uh, AI. And in that article, you talked about the need to get clear on cognitive labor as distinct from physical labor. Um, and I think this is really appropriate to think about uh, during this talk where we're talking about AI uh, empowering folks. And so I wondered if you could share a bit about that perspective on cognitive versus physical labor and how it shapes your thinking around AI. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the thing that we have seen over the past few years is um, AI machine learning, particularly, you know, these large models, transformers, things that are, you know, trained using self-supervised learning and attention, um, really have been having a huge impact, but they're having a maybe a slightly different impact than what we thought they were going to have. Uh, you know, so I, I know a lot of people, you know, five, six, seven years ago were thinking that the trajectory that AI was on uh, meant that we were going to have, you know, robots, uh, you know, doing a bunch of uh, physical work that people had uh, historically been doing. And what, what we have instead are machine learning systems, uh, software systems that have a, one of these models in them somewhere or the other powering part of what they're doing that are actually assisting us with cognitive work. Um, and, and I think the curious thing about this is like we don't really have a proper definition yet of what cognitive work is. And if you go back into the historical record and you just sort of look at what happened at the height of the industrial revolution when we had these machines that were coming in and assisting people and sometimes substituting completely, uh, you know, the, the, for the work that human beings had been doing exclusively themselves. We also didn't have a theory of, of what that mechanical work was, uh, like we'd just sort of been doing it, uh, you know, because we had evolved our society in that way. Uh, and it took a while for the theory and the research to give us a precise set of definitions for what physical work actually is. And I think that's an important thing that we have to 
figure out over the coming years. Like we, and, and, and it will be a theory that co-evolves. Like it, it's not that we, we're going to wait around to get the perfect uh, theory b before we advance the models. Um, but, it, but it's just really important to think about like what the models are doing are, is sort of helping us with cognitive work, which is very, very different from, you know, like a manufacturing robot or, you know, things that are, you know, doing things that require fine motor control or, or, or whatnot. Uh, absolutely. And I know at Microsoft, you know, we focused a lot on, uh, you know, particular uses by developers, by creators um, in terms of advancements in large scale AI. And so, you know, you've, I mean, it, needless to say, you've had a front row seat uh, to this. And so what, you know, what have you found surprising? What kind of uh, patterns are you seeing relative to use and adoption? Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the uh, one of the stunning things that happened over the past year is work that OpenAI did uh, based on large language models that resulted in a model called Codex that is able to translate uh, natural language expressions of intent into actual code. And Codex became the underpinning for a product called GitHub Copilot, which is, uh, you know, like you can think of it as a virtual pair programmer or a coding assistant. And it is, uh, it, it's a way for you to sort of, s a programmer to say, this is the code that I'm trying to write uh, in natural language, and then the model writes it for you. And the surprising thing is just how well it works, because intuitively you would sort of look at, at software development and think, oh my goodness, like this is an incredibly complicated piece of cognitive work. Uh, like it's, it's, you know, we're managing all of this complexity in our heads, uh, like mistakes are easy to make, uh, you know, like we, we, we have an entire, I mean, our discipline, right? Computer science is, uh, you know, just a, a, an incredibly rich academic discipline around managing this whole enterprise of like, how do you how do you build software? Um, and and so it was sort of surprising that it worked at all. Um, and then it's really been surprising how well it works. Uh, so, um, you know, things are getting better and better all the time. So these numbers are just improving. But when we launched GitHub Copilot to, uh, to a, a general audience uh, a few months ago, it was writing more than 40% of the code that its uh, users were producing which is just sort of a stunning number. Um, and, and I think the important thing, like you've sort of touched on it in a couple of places, like you've talked about collaboration and assistance, like the, 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 the product itself is built in a very particular way. It's called GitHub Copilot. It's not intended, nor could it write all of the code that the world needs to write. It is a way to take people who have huge cognitive demands on them already and trying to give them a tool that helps them be more productive. Uh, it, yeah, and it's, and it's fascinating to think about the evolution of that relationship and that collaboration. And on the development of tools like this, we have to think about um, the mental model of the person. Uh, and the developer then has to have some kind of internal model of the machine uh, and, and what kind of outputs are likely to be created. So, I mean, it, just, if you can just say a little bit about what, what you're seeing there and how you, how you think about that. Yeah, it, it's, it is fascinating. And, and it, it, like, the thing that I will say is it's always been changing, right? Uh, I mean, w you and I are both, uh, well, I'll speak for myself, I'm old enough uh, to remember the way that I learned how to program. Uh, like, my mental model for the machine and the software was pretty low level. Like, you understood, you know, like, what was happening on the bus of your microprocessor and, you know, assembly and machine language and, like, very, very low level details about the machine uh, when you were writing something higher level. And what we've had over the years is just increasingly powerful abstraction layers that let us do more and more stuff. So, you know, e even before the advent of something like GitHub Copilot, like the mental model of, you know, a, a computer science students has of a machine is different in 2020 than it was in, you know, 1984 when, uh, you know, just right around the time I was writing my first real programs. Um, 
and so like this is just another abstraction layer, uh, and I do think it will, you know, to your point, require some time for folks to, you know, get their head wrapped around exactly how powerful it is. I mean, and that's the thing that we're looking at right now. So, the the interesting thing to me about GitHub Copilot is that it's just one Copilot. So the, the way that we built this, the tools that we use, the models that we use, like the pattern that it, it uh, um, you, you know, that, that it, it is an instantiation of is going to be very, very broad. Like you're going to have lots of co-pilots for different types of cognitive work. And, you know, the way that we're thinking about it at Microsoft is we want to build the platforms and to make the capabilities available so that other people can go build those things. Like we're not going to build a thousand different co-pilots for every type of cognitive work in the world. Like we want other people to go build those things. Yeah, absolutely. And so delving into that a little bit more. So there's the use of a product like Copilot by developers. And then there's the ways in which utilizing these models as platforms really changes what it means to be a machine learning, uh, you know, engineer or scientist. Yep. Um, so can you say a little bit about this notion of, you know, models as a platform and how that informs how we're moving forward in the space? Well, I, I think it's easier to see in 2022 as we're having this conversation than it was a few years ago. This is a thing that we believed in pretty powerfully for the past four or five years. Uh, and like we've been investing like crazy to uh, create these models as platforms um, yeah, in, in collaboration with OpenAI and, and the work that's happening at Microsoft Research and across the across the company. And, and you know, and, and there are some people outside of uh, uh, you know, Microsoft's orbit that also have the same vision of models as platforms, you know, like uh, you know, my my good friend Demis Acebus at DeepMind is uh, you know, like has a very similar sort of vision and like they're doing extraordinary work as well. And so the the <laughs> You know, I, I think the thing that's obvious in 2022 is like you can just sort of go to Hacker News, you can go read tech blogs, you can talk to developers in Silicon Valley who are building startups, and yeah, you know, they're they're like, oh my god, look what I got GPT three to do. Uh, you know, look look at what I've been able to create using these large language models, uh, and that is the best possible um, proof that they're functioning as platforms. So people who didn't train the models themselves, who didn't have to incur the expense of you know, getting all of this data and all of this compute uh, together to build a giant model are able to take the model and manipulate it in a bunch of, you know, both straightforward and complicated ways to do a thing that they want to do. Um, and I think it's super exciting. And, and it we, we're going through this transition inside of Microsoft. Uh, it, it's an interesting transition. But, you know, again, like we in machine learning and AI are, we, we've just become accustomed to these transitions. I, I remember when I was in graduate school, uh, like the state of the art in AI was, you know, heuristics and knowledge-based systems and planning and, uh, you know, and all of that stuff was good. Uh, and then, yeah, I remember when I left academia and started in industry, like the state of the art for things like speech recognition, for instance, were classical models. Like they were, you know, hidden Markov models and, you know, uh, just sort of these classical probabilistic techniques. And then over the course of a few short years, deep neural networks like completely changed the the, the way that those disciplines work. And like we're just at another one of those points where like these platform models uh, are – or like, I, I think I, I've been calling platform models for four years. Like I think the, uh, the, the name that the industry is converging on is foundation models, but like these foundation models really are, um, changing the way that you do machine learning. Like you no longer are like, okay, well I've got to get all the data. I'm going to train my model. Like I'm choosing the, you know, the fundamental model architecture. I'm, uh, you know, like I'm, fine tuning it into my application I'm you know, and, and just sort of end to end owning the whole thing. It's like now you take a dependency on a large language model, you may be able to zero shot uh, the model into your application where you do no fine tuning or you might do some fine tuning or some prompt engineering or uh, it, it's just a very different way of using the machine learning tools. As always, new technologies and applications 
come with both opportunities and risks. Microsoft remains committed to advancing AI in accordance with our responsible AI principles. Our Office of Responsible AI and Ether Committee work together to ensure that these principles are practiced as new products and services are developed. They conduct impact assessments and review potentially sensitive uses. These activities are tightly interwoven with research and both fuel and benefit from new collaborations and scholarship. For example, in Microsoft's Turing Academic Program, our research scientists and engineers work closely with academics on various topics related to large models, including ethical considerations like bias and transparency. The continuing evolution of large-scale AI motivates many exciting and important research frontiers. We've already touched on a few in this talk, including co-creating with AI, pursuing new theoretical understanding, and building AI responsibly. Our track at this year's research summit explores three directions in particular, efficiency, adaptability, and collaboration. These directions are at once motivated by the practical challenges presented by large-scale AI and inspired by the amazing things that our human intelligence does so well. As information processing systems, our brains are efficient. They are far more complex than our largest AI models to date, yet they run on about the same amount of power needed to run a light bulb. Our brains have evolved to quickly adapt to an ever-changing world and tackle previously unseen challenges. And we have social intelligence that enables us to collaborate effectively to pursue goals. The research that we'll hear about in today's session has three high-level and interconnected aims. First, create AI that is efficient in both training and in application. Through innovation across AI models, software systems, and hardware, we're aiming for AI that can smoothly scale to fit any computational footprint from the cloud to the edge. Second, create AI that is adaptable across an even broader range of previously unseen environments and tasks. Our research community and many collaborators are pursuing approaches from integrating pre-trained models with external sources of knowledge to developing modular architectures that can be composed and activated based on the task at hand. And third, create AI that is collaborative. As large-scale AI becomes increasingly sophisticated, so must our ways of interacting with it to achieve outcomes that match our intent. Our community is exploring new methods in this direction ranging from collaborative fine-tuning to collaborative task execution. I'll close by illustrating these directions with a few examples. First, I'll preview a few examples aimed at making large-scale AI more efficient. One way to make large-scale AI models more efficient for a particular application is to use that large model to train a smaller one. In this scenario, we call the large model a teacher and the smaller model a student. Through research in this area, we've seen that student models can far outperform a model of the same complexity trained from scratch. Of course, compressing large models requires making a trade-off between accuracy and computation. Many approaches to training student models require manual development of a student architecture that achieves only a single point in this trade space. Recent research at Microsoft has leveraged techniques in neural architecture search to automate the process of developing student models. This automated approach yields not one, but a set of students that provide maximum accuracy for different choices of computational footprint. Another way to make a large-scale AI model more efficient is to create a modular architecture where only a portion of the model is used in response to any particular input. This approach has the potential to create models that achieve massive scale without significant increase in computational cost. Mixture of experts is one such approach, where the data transformations inside the model are broken up into expert modules that can be activated separately. Of course, breaking up an architecture into components creates a new challenge, deciding how and when to use those components in response to different inputs. The risk is now that the total capacity is underutilized. One of the talks you'll hear today will describe an architecture that randomly activates pairs of expert modules based on the input data. This enables the modules to learn from data and from each other during training to make efficient use of the model's total capacity during inference. 
In our experiments, this particular model turns out to be highly energy and data efficient while providing state-of-the-art performance on language translation tasks. This includes translation of low-resource languages without as much available data for training, such as Vietnamese and Latvian. Second, I'll share a few projects aimed at making large-scale AI more adaptable. Now, one aspect of adaptability is focused on model architecture. Creating sparsely activated models can help make them more easily adaptable to new tasks. The two examples I just shared are task agnostic in that the activation of the model is not directly conditioned on the particular task being performed. Multitask learning is another approach to creating modular architectures. In this case, though, instead of randomly activating the different expert modules, they are activated based on the task at hand. Training a single model to perform many different tasks, such as translating among different language pairs, can alleviate the need to create many different fine-tuned application models. However, it can also create the potential for interference among the different tasks. For example, imagine requesting an English to Italian translation and getting back French. Recent experiments have demonstrated that multitask learners with task-aware routing of inputs can improve generalization to tasks not seen during training and help avoid catastrophic forgetting when learning new tasks. Another aspect of adaptability is focused on data. The massive data sets we use to train large-scale models are drawn from the human body of knowledge at a moment in time. This creates the risk that a model's knowledge of the world is simply out of date when used for applications like question answering. To illustrate, we asked GPT-2, a previous generation large language model trained in 2019, about an event that occurred in 2022. The base model provides a statistically plausible but not very useful answer based on related information from its training data. Through a technique called knowledge-infused decoding, we're able to augment the base model by automatically retrieving related information from an external knowledge source. In this case, the model automatically augments our query with related information from Wikipedia, enabling it to provide a more current and coherent response. Lastly, we'll cover a few examples aimed at making large-scale AI more collaborative. As AI continues to advance new paradigms for facilitating effective collaboration between humans and machines will be essential to achieving our desired outcomes. In our previous example, we showed how user prompts can be augmented with external knowledge to make them more adaptable. This approach can also be utilized to facilitate goal-directed dialogue between a user and an AI agent to enhance collaboration. The Godel technique shown here uses dialogue history as part of the input to a transformer model, in addition to relevant information retrieved from external sources. In the example shown, the AI agent makes a restaurant recommendation by taking into account the user's preference for inexpensive Portuguese food expressed in previous prompts, as well as a customer review retrieved automatically via a search engine. Sometimes collaboration happens in physical environments where agents must interact with each other and with the world around them. Minecraft has become a commonly used environment for exploring human-machine collaboration in such real-world environments. In Microsoft's Playground, a human architect works with an AI builder to create structures by giving natural language instructions. In this interaction, large-scale models facilitate both language and scene understanding, enabling the AI builder to understand natural language instructions from the human architect and interpret the visual information within the Minecraft environment. Here, the Transformers language generation capability even enables the AI builder to ask clarifying questions of the user. In the example shown, when the human architect requests that a new structure be built, the AI builder is able to ask, how big? The projects that I've highlighted here are just a sample of the ongoing research at Microsoft and among our many collaborators around the world to make large-scale AI more efficient, adaptable, and collaborative. We see progress along these and related research frontiers as key to empowering more people, more of the time, through continuing advancement in AI. As the graphic suggests, we see these aims as distinct, yet deeply interconnected. Events like Research Summit present opportunities for both knowledge exchange and for new exploration at the intersections. 
Hope you enjoy the remainder of the efficient large-scale AI track at this year's research summit.